Sometimes games will include a cameo from a well-known celebrity or fictional character, and for the most part these cameos are included with the full knowledge, agreement and willing participation of the people involved. Is that an otter on my head? Or am I just happy to see you? <laughs> yes, even that one. Other cameos though are completely unauthorised, meaning that popular characters and recognisable personalities appear in games where you'd never expect them. What's more, in some cases, the developers even manage to avoid getting sued into oblivion for openly stealing a likeness or copyright. I'm Luigi Mario from Mario and I endorse this video about the 7 unauthorised cameos you won't believe they got away with! Beware spoilers for the following games. Wahoo! It must be annoying to have your company mascot and most popular character entirely ripped off, but it must be even more annoying to have that happen before their debut game has even come out. That's exactly what happened to one of gaming's most iconic characters in obscure Amiga game The Adventures of Quick and Silver, where one of the enemies you face early in the game is an extremely pissed off looking Sonic the Hedgehog. Hey, I'd be grumpy too if I was missing out on royalties. The wildest thing about this entire saga is that Quick and Silver debuted on a free disc that came bundled with issue 7 of Amiga Fun magazine in May 1991. This was around a month before the June 23rd release of the very first Sonic the Hedgehog game on the Sega Genesis, making this entirely unauthorised cameo Sonic's first home video game system appearance by a matter of weeks. Gotta go faster, I guess. As far as we know, the outrageous plagiarism in this bizarre low-budget Amiga game was first spotted by YouTuber Larry Bundy Jr. back in 2015, a year when he could have alternatively been playing uh, The Witcher 3 or Bloodborne or Metal Gear Solid 5, but you know, whatever floats your boat. Although the timing and similarity of these sprites to the real thing makes the Sonic clone one of the most egregious in the game, the Blue Blur is not the only character who gets ripped off in the adventures of Quick and Silver. There's also Bub from Bubble Bobble, the player character from an old game called Nebulous, and even a nod to the Ninja Turtles. Fortunately, even at the time this game was far too small and obscure to wake up any sleeping legal teams. Oh, and if you think a crudely animated unlicensed Sonic is bad, just you wait till you see what they did to Mario. At the risk of perpetuating Italian-American stereotypes, look how they massacred my boy. The title of this video might say that we can't believe that these games got away with these cameos, but 1989's Revenge of Shinobi kind of didn't. That's because it was legally required to release as four different versions during the time that it was on sale because the developers just couldn't stop including unauthorised cameos in their game. These were clearly based on whatever they'd just been watching at the movies before they headed into the office, starting with the enemy that was obviously Rambo, followed by this guy who starts as the Incredible Hulk, and then, in case Marvel aren't paying attention, switches to the Terminator for a copyright infringement double whammy. Then, in a turn of events that might seem odd to anyone expecting a normal side-scrolling beat-em-up, out comes Godzilla looking for a fist fight. The strangest enemy of all, however, is the boss of Round 6, who is Spider-Man. Not a guy dressed as Spider-Man or an enemy with Spider-Man's powers, but actual Peter Parker guy from the comic book Spider-Man, who has for some reason decided to take the side of international crime syndicate neo Zed. This was actually fine legally because Sega was officially licensed to make Spider-Man games. But what wasn't fine was the Japanese version of the game in which the character starts out as Spider-Man until you deal him enough damage, at which point he transforms into Batman. Did they have the rights to Batman? I'll give you one guess. How is Sega still around? Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, let's get ready to rumble! We missed the Ready to Rumble series of games. It was all the fun and pageantry of boxing with none of the concerns about the long-term health implications of being repeatedly hit in the head. 
this over-the-top pugilism parody binned off the real-world boxers and had a roster of colourful characters instead. And while there was one real athlete in Ready to Rumble Round 2, it was Shaquille O'Neal, who is, as you can probably surmise from this performance, a basketball player rather than a boxer. <laughs> He's probably still enjoying that more than appearing in Shaq Fu. But while Shaq was undoubtedly happy to license his name and likeness to the game, there were also a couple of clearly unofficial cameos. Finish Arcade Mode 9 and 10 times respectively, and you'd unlock the, at the time, sitting president and first lady, Bill Clinton and Hillary Rodham Clinton referred to in the game as Mr. President and the First Lady. And because this occurred after his impeachment trial, all the jokes are references to Bill's affair with Monica Lewinsky. Two-thirds vote says I'm gonna whoop you pretty good. And if you think the developers are gonna lower themselves to jokes about how punches in boxing are sometimes referred to as blows, then you'd be absolutely right. Hey, that's a low blow. I mean, hit. Satire, ladies and gentlemen. It turns out that Rowdy Rodham Clinton is also extremely handy in a boxing ring, busting out thematically appropriate quips and absolutely wailing on her opponents all while wearing a designer suit. I'll give you a background check. Dang, haven't seen her that mad since the 2006 confirmation of Samuel Alito to the Supreme Court. Am I right? This is not something a sitting president nor their partner would ever take the time to sign off on, and Ready to Rumble Round 2 specifically mentions it's not endorsed by them. However, Ready to Rumble Round 2 wasn't alone in ripping off this first couple, as the Clintons actually appeared unofficially in multiple video games. Clearly, Bill and Hillary's surprise boxing careers occurred while the first family was taking a break from playing basketball in NBA Jam, or from Bill relaxing in what is described as a redneck hot tub on the roof of the White House in Cruising, USA. Yeah. Keep politics out of gaming. Keep politics in gaming, more like. This stuff is amazing. Plenty of Street Fighter characters are based on real life pugilists, from Hugo, who is based on pro wrestler Andre the Giant. <laughs> To Fei Long, the series substitute for Bruce Lee. There is no way you could ever knock me out. To Akuma, who I think we can all agree is based on Dame Judi Dench. God, what the death? Yeah! Not looks-wise, just her whole vibe, you know. Nowhere is this more obvious, however, than in the character of Balrog, the boxer boss first introduced in Street Fighter 2, who is just Mike Tyson. Round one. Fight! Like with the same haircut and dental work and everything. Oh, and if you were in any doubt as to this being what Capcom was going for, originally in the Japanese version of the game, the character was called Mike Bison. Yeah. Fearing a lawsuit in the West if they released a game with a character called Mike Bison who looked exactly like Mike Tyson, Capcom shuffled the boss names around so that M. Bison became Balrog and the character known in Japan as Vega became M. Bison. Turns out though that they needn't have worried. Apparently Mike Tyson only discovered that Balrog was based on him in 2019 and said that he was honoured by the impersonation. Not Judy Dench though, I heard she went to the Capcom offices and did the Shin Shun Goku Satsu true instant prison murder on everyone. No chill that one. talk about fights between 90s video game franchises is usually between Sonic and Mario. Well imagine that but with more punching. 1994 was the absolute peak of the fighting game wars and before 3D shooter games really took hold as the most popular genre, 1v1 fighters were the biggest games on the planet. Although there were all manner of Mortal Kombat and Killer's Instinct out there, two Japanese companies Capcom and SNK had a special rivalry for national pride. Capcom's big release for 1994 was Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo, the definitive version of the most famous fighting game in the world. SNK, meanwhile, had King of Fighters 94 six months later, which pitted teams of three against each other. 
As the scrappy underdog, SNK took the opportunity in King of Fighters 94 to take a few subtle and not so subtle digs at the Street Fighter series of games. <laughs> One of the not-so-subtle ones there. The most surprising bit of shade involved the game's final boss, Rugal Bernstein, a smug, super-hateable crime lord who goes easy on you in the first round, but in the second round, what he loses in upper-body clothing, he gains in extremely powerful attacks. Guess that jacket and shirt were really weighing him down. In Rugal's introductory cutscene, it's explained that he has a collection of statues of worthy foes who he has defeated in combat. The eagle-eyed will spot that some of these statues resemble characters from the Street Fighter series, most notably Guile, owner of the third tallest hairdo in fighting games. As you can see from this graphic I prepared earlier, it's actually not even close. Naturally, this little cameo implies that Capcom's Guile had at some point in the past been given a sound kicking by SNK's own character Rugal. Got Which we're prepared to believe, because SNK bosses are cheaper than a Wish.com wedding dress. At that price, why aren't all my clothes wedding dresses? Evidently, the two companies put aside their petty differences, because five years later, they would be making crossover fighting games that featured characters from both series, and long before Sonic and Mario ever stepped into an Olympic stadium together. Capcom versus SNK. Millennium Fight 2000. Still, clearly Capcom remembered the slight, because if you queue up a Guile vs Rugal matchup in the Capcom-produced game, Capcom vs SNK, we finally find out what Guile himself makes of the whole statue thing. <laughs> he just cut that thing clean in two! Should have done a crossover with Mortal Kombat instead. The giant scissors once again search for prey. The trail of terror stretches across Europe. From Norway to England. If you're not familiar with the Clock Tower series, it combines the frantic panic of survival horror with the vague inaccuracy of a joypad controlled point and click game. It's a match made in hell. It doesn't help that for large chunks of this PlayStation 1 entry in the Clock Tower series, you're pursued relentlessly by Clock Tower's most terrifying foe, Scissor Man. See if you can guess what his whole deal is. Hey, maybe he's just heading to cut the ribbon on a new youth centre. You don't know. One sequence, Scenario 2, has you playing as tabloid journalist Nolan as you visit a character called Rick in his home. A home that is a completely average rural house, apart from the giant, ostentatious, haunted chandelier in the open plan living area. So it used to hang in the Barrow's mansion. Yes, what wonderful times they were, except for... I would simply not have stood directly underneath the obviously cursed light fixture. This tragic avoidable accident heralds the arrival of Scissor Man, who will then pursue you throughout this small house as you search for a demonic idol hidden in the closet. It's tense because of the tight confines of the house and the fact that occasionally you can shake off your pursuer for a short while. During one of those brief breathers, you can actually get the drop on Scissorman by re-entering a living room immediately after you exit it. Then you'll find Scissorman rocking in a chair, presumably taking a break from chasing you, and if you squint at the handful of pixels on the television screen, you'll be able to make out the distinctive shape of a running Tom from beloved cartoon Tom and Jerry. We're going to go ahead and assume that Warner Brothers wasn't contacted to authorise its kid-friendly cartoon being watched by a scissor-wielding murderer in a horror game. That said, in the cartoons Tom has been shot, run over by a train, and beheaded with a guillotine. 
so maybe Warner Brothers would have been fine with it. Anyway, having disturbed Scissorman from his cartoons, it's right back to being terrorised by one of the most viscerally scary enemies in all of the history of survival horror. Alright, watch his cartoons can be knocked out with a single punch. Can we all agree that the chandelier is the real villain here? In 1988, video game plots could be about anything, which is why Dynamite Ducks is about two bowtie-wearing ducks who beat up a bunch of other animals to rescue a woman from a sorcerer named Achacha. It was a simpler, much weirder time. Also popular in late 1980s video games, the unlicensed use of fast food mascots apparently, because the very first thing you see in Dynamite Ducks is a fiberglass statue of Colonel Harlan Sanders, founder of the Kentucky Fried Chicken Empire. Now, Colonel Sanders is no stranger to video games. Who could forget his appearance in WWE 2K18? Or the dating sim in which you try to date the Colonel himself in young, hunky Tsundere form. The difference with those appearances, however, is that they were officially licensed by KFC. Unlike this appearance in Dynamite Ducks, which the developers seemed to think they would get away with because they changed the name on the marquee to Kentucky Friend Chicken which has an extra horrifying layer when you consider that our duck protagonist is a bird and could very well have friends who are chickens. No wonder he's so violent. Wahoo! Wasn't that a great video? Oh, uh, it's Luigi from Mario. Oh, uh, turning up in a video like this! Who would have expected it? Please don't sue us, Nintendo, please. Um, if you would like to watch more videos, which may or may not have uh, cameos from recognisable video game characters. Uh, we have one up here from us and one down here from our sister channel, Outside Extra, which is also excellent. And hey, if you love these videos and you'd like to support us, why not join the OX Supporters Club over on Patreon? It's at patreon.com forward slash OX Club. That's right, isn't it? Luigi's Mansion games in the pipeline, Luigi? I'll never tell. So no then. No. <laughs>